Hello, hello. I've been doing some serious reading today and yesterday. We're going to talk about cheese and why it's so hard to give up. And we are going to cover reasons that we should quit. Or we will cover vegan cheese products, things that are out there on the market today that that help us enjoy cheese again after we've given it up, or you know, dairy cheese. And then I'd like to open it up to you all to share, you know, any vegan products that 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 have uh, you know proven successful for you, books that you've read. And then at the very end, uh, we will open it up for, for uh, you to share ways that you got past eating dairy. Okay, so I want to start with my own story real quick. I've already shared my story in a video before called um, Getting Over Cheese or something like that. It's on, I'm going to repost it to the Simple Daily Recipes channel. But essentially, <clears throat> when we... When it came time for us to give up cheese, that was like a really big thing for me. I made cheese the last thing that we gave up in our family. It was easy to give up meat and it, was, uh, it wasn't that big of, of a deal to not cook with oil. But giving up cheese was super hard. I was one of those super foodies that had like 10 different types of gourmet cheese in my cheese drawer. I loved walking through the foodie marts and trying all different cheeses from all over the world from all different types of animals. I was not afraid of cheese whatsoever. So, and Maggie was particularly a big cheese lover as well. She, you know, you know that she loves her black beans. You know, she had her black beans every day. And, and I had raised her to enjoy black beans with a little bit of sour cream on top or shredded cheddar. Okay, this is what she knew. And so the two, you know, kind of went together. So when we, when I said, okay, we got to give up cheese, how's the best way to go about giving up cheese? Well, the first thing I thought of, and I'll probably repeat this later on, the first tactic that I used to give up cheese was just to stop making those meals that had a lot of cheese in them to begin with. And um, things like pizza. I just, we just didn't have pizza night anymore. And our Campo burritos that usually had a lot of cheese. Um, I just didn't make that for a while. I tried to focus on all the recipes that that just didn't involve cheese that weren't cheese focused and we just kind of you know hobbled along on that and that was fine and everything was good and it was interesting that we really weren't missing you know missing cheese now when i say we i mean myself hubby and max maggie on the other hand because she was so small and it was not her decision to give up cheese i approached her differently I decided that instead of trying to, you know, make her go cold turkey, that I would back up cheese on her. I would, I would practice, or each time that I made her food, I would just put less sour cream or less cheddar cheese on her food to the point where there was just a little bit there. And it worked. It worked. She got to the point where she started enjoying just the beans and whatever else we had with she was having with it like tortillas or tortilla chips or something like that she was just enjoying that and and she was able she was able to get off the cheese it took her a while but she was able to do it now in the meantime i was trying to give up cheese but i was still preparing her food and one day i explained this in the video there was a day a couple of times that i would shred her cheddar cheese and I would, you know, drizzle it on her nachos. And out of habit, I would, you know, a piece of shredded cheese would fall off a nacho or something. And I would pick up that little shred and I was about to put it in my mouth. And I was like, whoa, uh, I almost ate that. Okay, well, let's put that back down. And then mindlessly, another piece of cheese would fall off. I would pick it up and I would try to eat it. I was like, I just instinctively wanted to eat it. 
and I, and I had to catch myself and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, all right, look, this is weird that my brain is like, pick up the, you know, my brain is saying, pick up the cheese and I'm not even thinking about it. So uh, I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Well, I was able to fight that a couple of times, but one day I was looking down at the cheese and for some reason the cheddar just smelled really, really good. And I was like, man, I want a bite of this cheese so bad. It's just, it's like everything in my power not to bite into this cheese. And I so badly just wanted to get up I really wanted to bite into the block of cheese. That's what I really wanted to do. And I was like, whoa. I was like, I couldn't believe how strong the urge was. It got to the point where as I was standing there, I actually felt like I had like an angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. And we were trying, you know, and they were like battling it out. And I was, one of them was like, don't eat that cheese. You know, it's got casein and fat and, you know, cancer and it's just bad for you. And then the other one was like, oh, it's just one bite. You know, just take a bite. You'll get past it. You just need one bite. And I was like, no, no, don't eat it. And then I was like, yeah, it's okay. You know, and I, I mean, I'm seriously, it got so strong and I kid you not, because I don't joke about stuff like this. I kid you not. The feeling, the desire to bite into that cheese got so strong that I had to pray. I'm serious. I had to pray and ask God to help me work past this intensely strong desire to eat cheese. I thought I, I wanted to l laugh at myself, but at the same time, I was so surprised at how deep this feeling was and how strong this feeling was to the point where I'm asking God to, you know, take time out of what he does to help me get over this, what, you know, this, you know, getting past cheese. I mean, I felt so silly, but at the same time, I felt so weak that I needed his help. Okay. So I prayed through it. I kid you, I prayed through it and I was like, I still kind of, you know, I still wanted the cheese, but I put it down. I was like, I am not going to eat this cheese. Whew. And I got past it. But I'll say that later on, not later on that day, but like later on, and I don't know, I didn't count the days, but later on there was a day where I was, you know, again, making Maggie some nachos with some shredded cheese on top and a piece of cheese was there and I wasn't really craving it, but I was like, you know, I haven't had cheese in so long. I wonder if it still tastes like the way I remember it tastes. So I went to take a piece, just a little sliver of cheese and I put that in my mouth and took a bite and my memory of cheese was nothing like the cheese I was biting into. Even though I thought I remembered what cheese tasted like, the cheese I put in my face was so salty and so nasty and sour, I couldn't believe that it was cheese. I actually thought that maybe I had sour cheese or, uh, you know, a cheese that had gone bad and I was serving bad cheese to Maggie. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so, so gross. And then I got really excited because I realized I had got past cheese. I had lived without cheese long enough that, that, that my memory of cheese was just that. It was just a memory and that my taste had changed and I really didn't need cheese at all. I was like, I'm over cheese. It was awesome. It was awesome. It was, it, and I, and since then, I have never wanted to go back to cheese. I, I think that that moment, you know, that, that one time where I thought, you know, that one time where I tasted it and I thought, Oh my gosh, that's really nasty. That fixed me. That fixed me just right. Okay, so why was the cheese so hard to get over? Why was it so hard for me to overcome cheese? And why did I have this strong desire to give up cheese? Why would I be driven to pray to get past it? Well, that was something that... that sat on me and I really wanted to know and that was why I bought this book by Dr. Barnard called Breaking the Food Seduction. This is an excellent book. It came out years ago. It covers all the all the things like meat. You know, people think that they can't get past meat. It covers chocolate, uh, the dairy, why we feel like we can't get past these foods. And it's the it's the evidence-based information 
uh, on why we have those connections, the things that are in those foods and why we are drawn to them. So, so this is definitely one book that if you feel you want to learn more about why we get hooked on the foods that we get hooked on and also learn, uh, uh, you know, get recipes that would help you get past those cravings, then this is a very good book. I've had it for a long time. It's easy, easy to read. And Dr. Barnard is just, you know, he's a terrific source for evidence-based nutrition information. Okay, so from his book, I'm going to have to put on my readers now. Okay, so when we think about cheese, you know, let, let's think about that, man. It's cheese, we're drawn to cheese, not because of the way it smells, because it stinks. Cheese stinks. It's not the way that it tastes, because it's actually quite sour. Um, just like, if you can remember, you know, you know, let's keep it real. If you can remember the first time you ever took a drag off a cigarette and how nasty that was. Or the first time you ever had alcohol, uh, a beer or a glass of wine. Remember how nasty it was? It, it didn't taste good. Nobody likes that stuff the first time. But there are, but we know that there are chemicals. The chemicals in those products are what our brain gets hooked on. That's why we find ourselves getting accustomed to the flavors so that we can get that hit that they provide. Well, cheese is the same, same way. So in 1981, I'm going to do a little bit of reading here, but I'm going to try to keep it fun. In 1981, Eli Hazem from the Wellcome Research Laboratories in North Carolina found morphine in cow's milk. Cows actually produce, uh, produce morphine within their bodies, just as the poppy plant produces morphine in its, in its, uh, in its body. Traces of morphine, along with codeine and other opiates, are produced in the cow's liver and can end up in their milk. Not long after, researchers found that cow's milk and the milk of any other species contains a protein called casein. Casein breaks apart during digestion to form opiates called casomorphines. Now, some of you may already know this, but there's a lot of folks out there that don't. So, in Power Foods for the Brain, another book by Dr. Barnard, it reads, Cows produce... Uh, milk for one reason, and that's to nourish their young. In, uh, in our digestive tract, milk's casein protein breaks apart to release mild opiates called casomorphines. They are not produced by our brain cells. They are actually in the milk protein uh, that nature meant for the rapidly growing calf. And as you digest it, the opiates are released and absorbed into your bloodstream. And in turn, these opiates trigger dopamine release. That's pretty wild to think about that, that there's morphine in cow's milk. Now, cheese is just concentrated protein. It's concentrated protein. I have watched cheese making in a cheese uh, from a dairyman. And... When they take the milk and pour it into the vat, they add bacteria to the milk that that helps the proteins in the milk come together and bind. And then all that's left is like the lactose sugar and the whey, the water in the milk. So all the protein in the mil cow's milk comes together in one solid clump. And then they take that and they strain it and pack it and add uh, coloring to it and then they age it. So cheese is just concentrated casein and so delivers a large amount of casomorphine in each dose. It may smell like old socks and have more saturated fat, cholesterol, and sodium than a steak, but but people flock to the cheese counter to get their hit of opiates and dopamine. Oh yeah, I would be one of those people that used to be like that. Oh my gosh, you used to run to the cheese section of the grocery store. When we think about cheese and its casein quality, one, uh, quantity, one ounce of cheese holds five grams of casein 
and in each one of those grams, it holds millions of individual casein module, uh, molecules. If you were to examine one of these casein molecules under a powerful mi microscope, it would look like a long chain of beads. The beads would be amino acids, the simple building blocks that combine to make up all the proteins in our bodies. When you drink a glass of milk or eat a slice of cheese, stomach acid and intestinal bacteria snip the casein molecular chains into casomorphines of various lengths. One of them, a short string made up of just five amino acids, has about one-tenth the pain-killing potency of morphine. That's, a, that's pretty wild. And think about how satisfying it is when we eat cheese. There's something that goes on there that we're like, ah. Same goes for chocolate, but that's a different day. Okay, that, that's what's in cheese that gives us the draw. We have, it has morphine and codeine and other chemicals in it that cause us to want it more and more and make it hard to give up. Now, let's talk about reasons to quit cheese. Okay, first off, fat. Oh my gosh, 70% of the calories in cheese is made up of fat, saturated fat. When I looked in Dr. John McDougall's book, The Starch Solution, he talks about dairy. Chapter eight, if you have The Starch Solution, you can refresh yourself on dairy and calcium uh, in chapter eight. So Dr. McDougall says that cheese is the worst offender when it comes to foods that cause us harm. Roughly 70% of its calories come from fat and fat is the major contributor to obesity and from obesity comes type two diabetes. Fat is highly publicized as a hazard of consuming dairy products. We know that already. But dairy proteins and the milk sugar lactose also lead to common illnesses. The protein in milk increases growth hormones like IGF-1 that promote the development and growth of common cancers such as breast, prostate, colon, brain, and lung cancer. Dairy proteins are a major contributor to food allergies and more serious autoimmune diseases as wide ranging as rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, and multiple sclerosis. Intolerance of the milk sugar lactose causes a majority of people worldwide to become ill with stomach cramps, diarrhea, and gas. There we go. So we've got that. Now, so there's fat. We don't wanna take the fat in. I also learned in, let's see, aluminum. I learned in Power Foods for the Brain that, uh, that aluminum, this, this stay on topic, aluminum is considered by the USDA to be a safe ingredient. We don't need aluminum in our body but it is present in our foods, like baking soda. It's present in processed cheeses, particularly those that are used on froze, in frozen foods, like frozen pizza. And aluminum, uh, the research is still building, but aluminum has been connected to Alzheimer's. Okay, so there's another reason why we don't want to be eating processed cheese, especially in processed foods. So we can keep the aluminum out of our brains and keep our keep our wits about us okay and another book by the physicians committee of responsible medicine i learned that dairy has been um connected to cataracts dr bernard says and well actually the physicians committee of responsible medicine said here that drinking milk which has uh, caused a number of troubling health concerns, also causes eye problems for some. As milk products are digested, they produce a simple sugar called galactose, which can enter the lens of the eye. Infants who are unable to break the sugar apart 
develop cataracts, a cloudiness in the lens that impairs vision, within the first year of their life. Population studies have shown that adults who live in regions where dairy products are commonly consumed have much higher rates of cataracts than those where dairy products are rarely consumed. Because the troublemaker here is the milk sugar and not the fat, using skim variations of milk offers no protection. So that's a trip. I never th thought that milk and cataracts were went together. Uh, milk is also keeps us from proper iron absorption. So uh, in the same book, people with normal or low iron stores will benefit from adding vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables to their diet without the risk of overdoing it. A true iron deficiency found by taking the test of taking test doesn't mean that you should add meat to your diet. Vegetables and beans are the healthiest iron sources available. Your doctor also may prescribe supplements for temporary use. Um, also, since dairy products inhibit iron production, iron absorption, avoiding them generally helps your body naturally regulate its iron balance. I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, and then the next thing is um, when we think about dairy products and cheese, we often think about our calcium and our calcium intake because we've been told over and over again that, that cheese is a source of calcium and we need calcium to have strong bones. Well, that's not, you know, uh, some of us here already know that by eating animal products, we actually, we actually cause more bone loss and eat and, and drinking cow's milk and, and animal proteins causes more bone loss then actually puts calcium on our bones. But let's talk about our lady stuff for just a minute. Let's talk about, uh, I want to share with you calcium and its connection to PMS. Uh, same healthy eating for life. It says there is evidence that getting into better calcium balance can ease menstrual pain, especially milder varieties. In one study, Calcium carbonate supplements, 1,000 milligrams per day, reduced both menstrual pain and PMS symptoms. A combination of calcium and magnesium also reduced pain and premenstrual water retention while improving mood and concentration. It is important to remember, however, that attaining ideal calcium balance is not just a matter of adding more protein, but also keeping the protein you have. Animal proteins force your kidneys to remove too much calcium from the blood and excrete it into the urine. By keeping animal products out of your diet, you can cut your calcium losses in half. In half! That's amazing. By including green leafy vegetables, beans, lentils, and other calcium-rich plant foods and fortified orange juice in your diet, you will ensure that you get plenty of calcium and that it stays where it belongs. You can further reduce your calcium losses by avoiding excess salt and sugar, limiting your coffee to two cups per day, so that's only two trips to Starbucks a day, okay? <laughs> avoiding tobacco, that's a given, exercising regularly, and getting vitamin D from the sun or a multivitamin. One la last piece here. It is best to avoid getting calcium from dairy sources because of the significant animal protein and sodium load they provide, which serves to deplete much of the calcium they contribute. And surprisingly enough, only 30% of the calcium they contain is readily absorbed by your body. Think about that. 30% of the calcium from animal products is even available for your body to absorb, if your body even needs it. Most vegetables and beans have plenty of low-fat, highly absorbable cal calcium, and magnesium-rich foods such as soybeans, beets, greens, oh, beet greens, I'm sorry, beet greens, black-eyed peas, and tofu aid in calcium absorption even further. Well, that's some good stuff. And one last piece, 
a bonus to why we should be cutting cheese from our diet is that because cheese is such a concentrated source of fat and protein, <clears throat> a two ounce serving of cheese has at least 15 grams of fat and about 200 calories before it even touches your sandwich. When you set the cheese aside, you've spared yourself all that fat and all those calories. Now, at the time of this book, it says here that Americans, instead of cutting back cheese, they're eating more cheese. The dairy industry figures show that annual cheese consumption in the U.S. doubles from 15 pounds per person in 1975 to 30 pounds in 1999. Oh, that's amazing. That is pretty wild. So, so by leaving the cheese off, we can save ourselves saturated fat and calories that add to our waistline. We just leave that out. Okay, okay, now I want to talk about vegan cheese products. This is where y'all get to throw in. Back to my story when, as far as transitioning off of dairy, like any, any other, you know, plant-based newbie, I just thought right off the bat that the best way to get off animal dairy was to just jump right into the vegan dairy stuff. Well, guess what? That did not work for me. Didn't work on my family either. Going straight from cow's cheese or sheep cheese or goat cheese to vegan cheeses was like totally gross. Totally gross. The first time I ever had diet cheese, I thought it was the nastiest, greasiest stuff I had ever put in my mouth. I thought, oh my gosh, what is, maybe it's, you know, maybe I got a bad bag. So then... I went and bought like the follow your heart and I bought all the, I spent the money and wasted the money to buy all these vegan cheeses that I could get my hands on. And we tried all of them. And because we had the taste of cheese, our brain had not forgotten what it tasted like. Our, our taste buds had not changed yet. All those vegan cheeses tasted nasty. Okay. Show of thumbs ups who has experienced the same thing where you tried vegan cheese before you gave up cheese and you thought, oh my gosh, this is the grossest stuff ever. Um, so what I ended up doing was I just had to, I just gave up. There you go. There's the thumbs up. That's it. Th yeah, it's just gross. And I try to make a point with anybody and I, I'll say it here to everyone here. That if you're still eating dairy, you're, you're still having regular cheese, <clears throat> do not go and buy vegan cheeses. I don't care how good they are. I mean, we're about to talk about some really good vegan cheeses here in just a minute, and we've probably already started in the conversation. But I'm going to tell you, I don't even, I would not even advise a cheese eater to go and try those cheeses until they have spent a good, I don't know, two months without animal cheese or dairy cheese, okay? You need to give yourself time to change your taste buds, change um, the way you taste food, back off of the oils and the fats. You got to get used to not eating such fatty foods. Learning to enjoy, you know, meals that have been, vegetables that have been water sauteed. Learning to enjoy, uh, cre you know, things that have cream sauces instead of cheese sauces. Uh, you know, all those stir fries and stuff like that. You've got to clean up your taste buds and change your thinking before you can even try any of those vegan cheeses. And I'll be completely honest, even when I tried those vegan cheeses after I changed my taste bud, it still didn't win me over right away. I am not a big vegan cheese, you know, fan, really. There's only one vegan cheese maker that I absolutely love that, like, wakes up my food desires, and that is Miyoko Shinner's artisan cheese 
her cheeses that we buy from her that she makes those are the bomb I love those things thankfully they are pricey and I cannot afford to buy them all the time so they don't end up on my thighs quite as often as they could thank you Miyoko for making them pricey <laughs> okay so um so there's so for uh, now this next piece I'm really talking to anyone who's still eating dairy cheese I want to say to you there are common cheese products out there that uh, are the you know that have hit the mainstream things like uh, the most popular is Daya follow your heart I know that that uh, we've already mentioned them here uh, um, a more higher end brand called Kite Hill is known for its cream cheese Rosemary Zarega here she I was at her house a few weeks back and she had the Kite Hill cream cheese and I had a chance to taste it and it was very good scary good that kind of very good I was really glad that it was at her house and not at mine but nice to know that it's out there um, again Miyoko Shinner everything that I have tried from Miyoko's kitchen uh, her artisan cheeses are uh, very good and my kids love them my husband we order them at Christmas time uh, actually I'm sorry we ordered them at Thanksgiving and we ordered them again at, at Christmas time which I think this last year I actually just ordered a whole bunch and then I split them up and we just nursed them from Thanksgiving to Christmas but so far that's the only time I order her cheeses and that just keeps us you know on track I just you know some things I just don't want to make a habit of okay even though I absolutely love them uh, okay now uh, go ahead oh I'm gonna I'm gonna go get a, a book and if y'all haven't already take this opportunity to um, share vegan cheese brands that you found to be the most tasty uh, go ahead and spare you know spare us the ones you don't like but give us the ones that um, that you like the most Yvette is asking do those brands have oil in them I'm pretty sure that all the Daya I know that the Daya cheese uh, follow your heart I believe those have oils in them they're oil based um, Miyoko Shinner's cheeses are uh, based on nut milks and she she learned to make cheese the traditional way and then took that took her um, education and used it to make nut cheeses so when you're trying Miyoko Shinner's cheese it is cheese it is just based on nut milks and um, and culture you know cultured uh, cultured cheese so it's it is a cultured cheese I'm sorry that was kind of all out of order but uh, Paula says $14 for cheese for me here so it takes care of me buying vegan cheeses there you go that's what I have to pay for Miyoko Shinner's cheese here in Kauai yeah you know it's pricey here I think I haven't purchased any Miyoko's cheeses um, at Whole Foods but I believe I paid $12 for uh, a, a, a little wheel that was about an inch and a half thick uh, probably about a four inch maybe three inches wide inch and a half thick that's pretty pricey but again I'm not even knocking it you know there's a lot of work that goes into that that cheese is cultured it has to be put up just it has to be aged and uh, so there's a lot of man hours put into that cheese and I'm sure she's not you know she's not getting wealthy on it so whatever the price of her cheeses are I'm sure that they are it is a reasonable price I'm just thankful that it's not you know it's not something that I can afford to do all the time so uh, Oh, Rosemary says here at Whole Foods in Austin it ranges from nine dollars to twelve okay let's talk about cookbooks that have helped us make our own cheeses so like we've kind of already covered in the discussion a lot of the the brands that we find in the grocery store are made with oil which does not go with um, our diet if we're trying to avoid oils okay most uh, I know there's many of us that are um, we're 
we're plant-based, whole food plant-based, either one of those, and we're trying to go no oil. It is hard to completely to go to go completely without oil, especially when we involve going to restaurants and stuff like that. But on the subject of vegan cheese brands, pretty much most of them have oil, with the exception of Miyoko Shinner's being a nut milk based cheese. Okay, so on the topic of cookbooks, you can, the most common cheeses that we can make ourselves are cashew cheeses or cheese sauces. And you can find those in, uh, I know that Dr. McDougall has a delicious cheese sauce, I believe in starch solution. It might be in here. I'm pretty sure that it is that it's made with rolled oats. I even have a video for it. You can look at the no fat cheese sauce recipe video that I have and it's a McDougal recipe. I'm not sure if it's on if it's in if I found it in starch solution or I may have found it on the McDougal in one of the McDougal newsletters, but that is a good one. Okay, here is Miyoko's uh, book that she that came out years ago, Artisan Vegan Cheese. Now, this is not an oil-free cheese-making book, but it is not entirely all oil. So, there are cheese recipes in here where you can learn to make... Um, you can learn to make a meltable mozzarella, uh, a meltable Monterey Jack, a meltable cheddar. Let's see. Those do have oil, but I believe you can... She has notes in here on reducing the oil or leaving the oil out. Um, when it comes to the meltable cheeses, I think oil does play a factor in, you know, in it being a meltable cheese. But if you don't need it to be a meltable cheese, like you want a more solid cheese, then you leave the oil out. Um, there's also recipes in here for creamy yogurt cheese, yogurt-based cheeses. So those are great. Those are oil-free. Um, you just have to learn how to make the basic yogurt cheese recipe, and then from there you can season it and add ingredients to it to change its flavor. Another uh, delicious cheese source that I am enjoying is from Mimi Kirk. Mimi Kirk uh, is a raw foodist, raw foodist chef. I'll back up here. Uh, she has some incredible, incredible recipes. She is not oil free, but you don't have to put oil in the recipes. So, uh, but she has a, I've got it pinned here. She has a pimento cheese recipe, cream cheese, cheddar cheese, a basic herb cheese, and is that it? That's it on this one. Sour cream, cashew parmesan, and that's it. So those recipes I am very interested in trying because they are nut-based, they have a few flavors, and they use a probiotic powder to help them ferment and set up. And then you've already seen me make a cashew cheese with a probiotic powder. You saw that, um, you saw that recipe I just posted about a month ago. And that was based on what I learned from Mimi Kirk in her, in this, uh, not this raw book. I have a different raw book from her, but uh, I learned how to do that from her. So I'm looking forward to exploring more raw food-based cheeses um, because they, they really taste like tangy, a tangy soft cheese. So that's a lot of fun. Oh, Tara, thank you for reminding me about chow cheese. Oh my goodness, I totally forgot about chow cheese. Now that is a delicious, chow cheese is put out by Field Roast, the same company that makes Field Roast sausages. You've seen me uh, use their products in, when I make, um, when I've done the cabbage and sausage recipes. So they have, they have uh, I think three sliced cheeses and they are coconut milk based, I think. And they are exceptional. They're creamy, creamy cheese slice. I think it's just called creamy. Tastes like baby Swiss. It has the texture and tang of a baby Swiss. And Maggie and I, when we find it on sale, which it is rarely on sale, but when we do find it on sale, 
We will buy a package. This is total confession here. We will buy a package and we will eat it. The two of us, we share it. We don't even tell the boys that we have it. We eat it while we're in the car. And there's only like maybe, I think there's six slices or eight slices to a package. And so she and I we just like four for you, four for me. That's how we do. We don't we don't share. And then when we get the cheese home, whatever survives, I hide it in the the refrigerator so only the two of us know where it is. That's some good stuff. Tara says cream cheese recipes would be handy for the holidays. I agree. That's hard to get around sometimes. Absolutely. I made Happy Herbivore has a cheese ball recipe in her holidays cookbook you know which one i'm talking about that's the last one that she put out and um it's a uh, it's good it is really good i made it last year for christmas in fact i made two cheese balls uh from that recipe and they were absolutely awesome they tasted just like the cheese ball that my Aunt Deb makes at Christmas that's made of cream cheese and Worcestershire sauce and shredded cheddar and it's get, like coated in pecans and all that stuff. Same, same. In fact, it was uh, Happy Herbivore's uh, recipe was even better. So go check that out. Go, go look around on her website and see if she has ever posted that cheese ball recipe or ask her or just go get the Go get that um, holidays book that she has. It, it has a lot of great recipes that will get us through the holidays. Okay, here it is. It's Happy Herbivores Holidays and Gatherings. Okay. And she's covering all the holidays and party ideas. So there's a, let me see. I won't read it off, but I will show you the picture of the cheese ball. Let me find it. Let me just look in the. It's a beautiful book, too. It's put out by Ben Bella. Ben Bella Books. Page 46. It's super easy to put together, and it's one of those recipes that you want to sit uh, in the fridge overnight. There it is. And it looks just like that. It is absolutely awesome. And I think it's uh, the basis chickpeas. That's what makes it so friendly as far as, you know, diet and all that stuff it doesn't have any nuts in it so it's nut free the base is chickpeas and extra firm tofu and then a bunch of spices so it but it turns out really good i think one of the things that i liked about it is it has a little liquid smoke in it which makes me think of worcestershire and i think that when i made it does she call for it she didn't call for it in there, but I'm so used to having a, a cheese ball that has Worcestershire in it that I went out and bought the vegan, what is it, Annie's vegan Worcestershire sauce, and I added a little bit of it to this recipe, and uh, it really hit the spot. So, anyways, check that out. Definitely add that to your uh, library before we get into the holidays because there's uh, it starts off with Thanksgiving and then moves to Christmas and hits all the holidays and special occasions that we run into all throughout the year. So it is a great book. Uh, Paula is saying that the Plant Pure Nation, page 206, Mac and No Cheese has a recipe for a no cheese sauce. Oh yes, and that one is made with butternut squash and it is delicious. You're absolutely right about that too. So, yes, if you have Plant Pure Nation, uh, I, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going to let y'all go. Thank you so much for being patient with me. Thank you for contributing. All right, I love y'all. Have fun. Take care of yourselves. Bye.